Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for Place to Hang Your Cape. And this week, this isn't like any of the sitcoms I watched growing up. We're talking about WandaVision. Cue the music. Hello there, Capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for Place to Hang Your Cape. My name's Scott James Merritt, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. Returning to us from before the times, it's Francisco Andrade! How are you doing, Francisco? Pretty good, pretty good, thank you. I'm very glad to hear that. I'm doing very good because, after a brief hiatus of Pod Capers, I have moved house! Very nice. Congratulations. I'm very happy. I'm very, very glad to be back in Edinburgh. So if there are slight sound changes, uh, Capers, if I don't know if there's an echo in this room. It's a much bigger room than I'm used to. Uh, those will be fixed down the line. We'll work with those as we go. Uh, I'm just glad to be back doing this because it turns out it's a very stupid idea of me to take a week off to move house because so much has fucking happened. Not even with WandaVision, just in the pop culture o sphere, and we're going to talk all about all of that right now in the news. First up on the news agenda, Avatar Studios. Have you heard about this, Francisco? Uh, which part? There's a lot going on with Avatar right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's the, the, the a brand new Avatar Studios <laughs> is going to create a metric butt ton of Avatar: The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra related content. Apparently, they're planning to do other animated series and movies. Specifically, we're going to start off with an animated theatrical movie set to begin production soon. I don't know much more beyond that. Uh, but I, do I do we need more? That sounds pretty fucking awesome. I I think it's a great idea. Oh my god, I love Avatar, and as long as M Night Shyamalan never touches it again, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, there has been so, we talked about this before on the show. There's been such a huge influx of Avatar love ever since it came out on Netflix. Old fans are returning, and new fans are discovering the show for the very first time, both young and old. It's fantastic. And people are remembering what they loved so much about it first time around. Same with Legend of Korra. And so it was inevitable that more stuff was going to come along. I know there has been a live action series uh, based on a remake of the original series that's been in production for a while. I don't know if that's still on board or what's going on with that, but considering the fact that um, I will remember their names one day, I will remember their names one day, uh, Michael Martino and Brian Konietzko, I don't apologize if I mispronounce those names, um, left that series because they didn't like the creative direction it was going. They wanted to age up the characters so they could fuck. That's what I heard, at least. I, I don't want to. I don't want to spread something around if that's not true. I mean, that this. sounds so Hollywood. So yeah. <laughs> now I, I've I've talked about this on the, on the show before. I would prefer that they didn't do a live action remake of something that we've already got. I'd rather they tell us new stories within the Avatar universe. And apparently, for the first time in my fucking life, the wish granting fairy was listening to my prayers. And said, and so you shall have it, Scott. Ding! And now I've got exactly that. We're going to get a whole bunch of new stuff. Maybe it'll be Avatar related, maybe correlated, maybe it was set in between those uh, uh, shows, maybe afterwards. I know I, I have actually been blessed recently because I only just discovered, shows how bad an Avatar fan, is at, fan I am, I only just discovered this. There have been two novels based upon the life of Avatar Kyoshi that had been released. I've got both of them. They were like the first purchases, last purchases purchases that I got um, before I left Oxfordshire to move back up to Edinburgh. Uh, I'm almost finished with the first one. I can't wait to start the second one. It's so good. It's so, so good. I've, been... <laughs> I've read oh. them both. Kyoshi's by far my favorite Avatar, um, just because her whole, I'm just going to destroy everything mentality that she showed in the series and it's amazing she's the best 
But you understand why she has that mentality, because it's, it, it's very much built up to, it's very much in keeping with her personality, but she still feels very much like the Avatar. And it's interesting to see her go on the slightly darker, but still possibly optimistic journey. I, I don't know. I haven't finished the first one yet, so no spoilers. But I'm very interested to see which direction Avatar... I mean, I say which direction Avatar Studios goes, because there's so many directions they could go. And it's at this point that I have been asked by my place to hang up with colleagues to repeat my personal hope that we get a story based on the Avatar, an Earthbender, after Korra, who I hope will be a Sandbender played by John Boyega. Oh my god, that'd be amazing. Because he said that he would love to be part of the Avatar in some way, because he's a fan. He's a fantastic actor. He needs to be in more bigger profile stuff. He's been in a few uh, smaller stuff right now, which is still very much excellent, but we need to get him out, out front because he's amazing and we need more actors like him. I mean, if you go look, see some of his past stuff, both uh, before and concurrent with Star Wars, like Attack the Block and Detroit, he's, he's really fucking good. And I want more. So, and I, I think it'd be something that he would love to do. I'd like to see the world progress further. I'd like to see, I'd like to hear about what happened to Korra after the events of those four seasons. It would be really cool. And there's so much more opportunities for stories like that to be told now. We can get more animated series maybe some more comic books uh maybe even a live action series that is worth our fucking time i personally would also like to see some sort of um anthology series uh documenting the lives of several past avatars that we haven't actually haven't got any focus on because we know up to i think avatar yang chen i think it is that's basically where our recent history of avatar ends and obviously there's avatar one the very first avatar who's awesome. Hey, maybe we get more Avatar 1 stuff. Steven Yeun, come back! <laughs> Why I, not? I completely forgot it was Steven Yeun. Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. I, I just I just love the idea. I can't get over the idea of the Sen Bending John Boyega, just because... <laughs> it's Sen a good bending, idea, right? <laughs> it was, Sen Bending was so minimal in the original Avatar series, but it was one of the coolest things. These guys are just windsurfing with sand and it looks amazing, and seeing seeing that live action, first of all, would just be amazing to look at. Mm. But also, because of after everything that happened in Korra, the technology is so advanced, and there's spirits everywhere. There's so many directions you can go. Ah, you sold me. I'm in. If I had the money, I would fund this. Also, I, th- I think it behooves us to... I mean, the Avatar was based upon... I, I say based upon... Not necessarily representation, but exploring our own modern day real world cultures through the lens of fantasy because most Western fantasy is shown through the lens of just that Western fantasy, European fantasy, European folklore. And so it was really cool to see some Asian fantasy and Asian folklore, but also with its brand in this brand new made up world. Uh, A lot of people have said that Avatar is a great example of representation and it is, and it, isn't like i don't think the burden of good representation should be hung on avatar's shoulders uh but it is it's it's still it would be cool to explore the diversity within the world of avatar is what i'm saying and doubtless there will be a ton more information about avatar studios in the coming days weeks months and years i for one can't wait one thing I can, however, wait for is our <laughs> next bit of news. This made me fucking laugh. Uh, Crystal Dynamics have announced that they are going to be introducing uh, a change to XP progression in Marvel's Avengers. They're going to make it grindier! <laughs> That's what people want in the video games. More grinding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously... Square Enix, Crystal Dynamics, had looked at the fact that 93, 96% of the player base, however much it was, abandoned the game within like the first two weeks or something, and thought, hmm, we need to make this game more appealing to people. I know, let's make it even more like a terrible MMO and just make them grind the shit out of things to play these shitty characters with these shitty controls and this shitty world that we shittily built full of shitty microtransactions and shitty loot boxes and go fuck yourselves because of dynamics. Ah. 
So, look, I mean, let me put it this way. I hate to be the one what pours cooled water on your small but perfectly formed bonfire. But no one gives a shit about your stupid game! I mean, I, I, oh my god. What did you think was going to fucking happen? Is this some sort of like elaborate, the producer style scam in order to make the worst selling game of all time? So you make insurance money back or something? And this is your attempt to dry back the last vestiges of your player base? What is wrong with you? It's it's horrible. I just, I don't get it. It honestly seems like self-sabotage at a certain point. <laughs> and... And it's the it's the craziest thing. It kind of reads to me like an Onion article. Like they're just like the next, <laughs> the next Avengers game is just going to be ninety six percent loading screens. <laughs> you joke, but that's I mean I played the beta. I didn't bother to get the actual game, and I'm glad I didn't because I, I was so looking forward to this game. I first saw the trailer, thought this looks so cool. It's got great visuals. It's got all these characters that I like. Great voice actors. They're the ones who I feel bad for, honestly, because. Most players have just completely abandoned the game, and the last hangers on are probably, I don't know, sunk cost fallacy or something. But these, like people like Nolan Law, Travis Willingham, all these people are now have. I don't know if they're still contracted, and they still have to provide voice uh, lines for expanding because they keep on bringing on new characters like Hawkeye and Kate Bishop are on. It's just like, do you like us now? Because we introduced them free. Sort of like all those free-to-play mobile games. You know, those really shitty ones that try and exploit people's addictions. You know, those things that have been all but, I think actually in some countries in Europe, actually outlawed because they're gambling and they're sold to children. Remember that? I just, it's its horrible. And I wish more people would take the the Blizzard Overwatch approach, at least with it. Or you release the entire game, and then if you want to pay for anything, you pay for skins that don't affect gameplay, but the characters are still released free for everybody. Well, they kind of have done that. The characters are released free, but the fact that the skins do cost money is part of the problem because I remember a time when the skins were included as part of the game that I fucking bought with my fucking money at a fucking shop. I remember that. And, and most, and some good games still do that practice. Thankfully, they maybe they'll have a, like a few DLCs, maybe a season pass if it's cost effective, whatever, fine. But skins and costumes are part of the game. They don't impact gameplay directly, but they impact my perception of the game and at least for me, and I'm speaking just for myself, when I see a game with skins, I want to get all the skins because I'm obsessive compulsive in that way. <laughs> and when a game locks them behind a paywall, I want to do a murder. It's horrible. I, I, we just want to play the game. We just want to play the game. This is all we're asking for. Just like, let us buy and play the game. We'll buy it. I, 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 it, I mean, the biggest uh, offender for me is the Assassin's Creed series now, because I'm a huge Assassin's Creed fan. I played the games when they first came out. It was like one of the first PS3 games I ever got, and it was awesome and cool, and I'm a big fan up to this day. But uh, ever since uh, that Assassin's Creed Origins one, they just released a ton of skins, but they provide microtransactions, no in-game currency that you can use to buy them. No, it's purely your own fucking money. And... I could live with that, maybe, if I was being very general, generous. And also, um, if I didn't buy the 70 quid, I don't know how much that is in US dollars, is the 70 quid, like, gold edition, which is supposed to have all the content in it. It does have a lot of DLC included with it, just not those fucking skins. So, go fuck yourselves, people who do that. You are greedy cunts. Moving on. I'm sure there's a ton of other pop culture news that uh, we need to talk about, but uh, one thing that has um, caught my eye recently, it's been announced very recently, that there is going to be a fourth Evil Dead movie. I am excited about that. I really am. A lot of people are excited about that. I feel I should temper your excitement slightly by the fact that apparently, according to information I have in front of me, um, Ash Williams, 
played by the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Bruce Campbell, will not be featured in the movie. Oh, come on. <laughs> That's all, just... Okay. You know what? I, I didn't mind the remake too much, the reboot series, like the first one. It, the, it was... the, the one with... Um... Uh, Suburgatory, Zoe's Infinite Playlist, whatever the fucking name is. Yeah, she. I think I think it was fine because it was uh, directed by Finn Alvarez. I think it was fine. Um, I wish they had ramped up the silliness of it a little bit more because that's the that's the issue with me. But I I thought it was fine and without Bruce Campbell. But after watching all seasons of Ash vs. the Evil Dead, I'm like, man, how are we gonna do this without Bruce Campbell? Yeah, it's. I mean, I suppose there's a way they could. I mean, I, I don't know. Is, is Sam? Let me just double check this. Is Sam Raby uh, going to direct? Da, 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 da. Is going to start shooting? Da, 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 da. I I did read this, but I, I've already forgotten. Da, 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 da. No, I don't see. I don't see any um, direct uh, indication that Raimi is going to going to uh, direct. Maybe he'll produce. Who knows? But I mean, the problem thing is, I've never been a huge fan of the Evil Dead. Not because I think it's bad. I haven't seen the first one. I have seen the second one. Honestly, my favorite one, having seen the TV series, uh, is Army of Darkness. I'm allowed. I'm allowed. But honestly, I, I mean, it, the problem is I went into Evil Dead 2 thinking it was going to be like Army of Darkness because I actually watched, watched them in reverse order. And I thought it was going to be, oh, this is going to be a horror comedy, so I'm going to laugh at this. And I went away thinking... Well, that was grim. It, it, it's not really to my taste, but I understand why so many other people like it. And so I just thought it would be appropriate to mention that we're getting a fourth one cool it's really annoying because we almost did get a fourth evil dead movie because there was a uh, deleted alternate ending to the uh, army of darkness where ash gets trapped in the far future because oh no i slept too long and he's like in the post-apocalyptic england or something and i was just thinking like that would be really cool to have incorporate like sci-fi elements with like deadites like zombie cyborgs i don't know I think that would have been really cool. We almost got that. We ended up not getting that because test audiences thought it was too grim. Motherfucker, it's called Evil Dead. What did you expect? Also, Evil Dead is the most eclectic franchise. They had a musical. They had a musical for like 10 years, 15 years, or some ridiculous notion that they had. If if your franchise can go have a 15-year run of a musical while being a horror movie, while being a comedy, you can do anything you want with it. So stop yeah. telling us what audiences want. We know what we want. We want to see a guy cut off zombies' heads with a chainsaw arm. Groovy. <laughs> and so that is the news. Uh, uh, Francisco, d- during my um, post-moving uh, funk phase where I'm being sort of disconnected from the world, are there any news uh, that you would like to share with us? That I would like to share. Uh, I've been... Uh, Ever, last time I was here, I'd written my first article for uh, for a place to hang your cape, and I've written a total of ten. So I've been keeping busy. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we want to talk about movies that just came out, I actually just saw Raya and the Last Dragon. Thank you, thank you for reminding me because I did want to talk about that. Um, yeah, so I wasn't sure whether I wanted to review this movie. We usually do review a lot of Disney movies, but I thought. Okay, you know what? I'll decide whether or not we review this movie if it has "quote unquote" premiere access. Guess what? It has premiere access, and I'm sorry, I refuse to be Mulaned a second time. I was so worried about that. I, I had a, I watched a, I watched Mulan the day it came out, and my wallet has been mad at me ever since. <laughs> <laughs> you wasted me for this. It was ho- it was so bad. Oh, and I kept watching it. I was like, it's gonna get better, and it didn't get better. Yeah. But Raya is absolutely not the same thing. 
I have heard very good things. And honestly, I would like to watch it, if not to review it later on. But I won't do it until it... Because, because fucking hell, if I'm going to betray my inner soul by using my money on a Disney Plus subscription... I actually do that, capers. I actually, I do subscribe to Disney Plus. I thought I could get away with it. I, but I honestly couldn't do this job the way I want to do it without Disney Plus. So, fuck it. I shelled out for it. I'm, I'm, I'm a whore. I'm a fucking whore, and I'm very, <laughs> very ashamed. But, but honestly, um, I have heard good things, and I would like to watch it because it, it did look pretty cool. The first trailer, the second trailer, thought, uh, but. I've heard a lot of good things, but then again, I've heard a lot of good things about some of the live action movies, and we all know how I feel about them! So, I can't promise we'll ever review it, Capers, but I'm glad you had a good time watching it, Francisco. Good for you. <laughs> it was good. I, I, will, I will give it two thumbs up. I think it went in, it was, it was similar to Moana in certain ways, and it oh. had... It had Last Airbender vibes and so in the in the travel aspect of it. Like the animation is gorgeous and that's to be expected. I think we can all give yeah. the animation always a thumbs up with these movies. And it's also a lot darker than I was expecting. It was surprisingly dark. The 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 hero is not some doe eyed like princess like trying to fix the world with love and uh and uh, talk no jutsu like in Naruto. They're definitely <laughs> She's she's around here like just ripping heads off and it's amazing. Fucking hell, way to sell me on this movie, jeez. <laughs> I, I mean that that sounds great. I was not a fan of Moana, not because I thought there was anything especially wrong with it, but just because it felt like the ultimate Disney checklist movie. Like princess wants something more, animal sidekick goes on an adventure. I mean, the only thing it was missing was the love interest, but I'm not, I don't give you points for not including bad things. I give you points for including good things. So Raya, hopefully will be a better experience for me. Who knows? I'm just glad that you had a good time, but I think it's finally time we move on to something we could all agree was fucking awesome. WandaVision. But before we do that, We've got some ads for you. Check them out. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Well, wasn't that fun? Anyway, WandaVision. I mean, uh, I... <sighs> I was, I mean, I was so hoping, I was so hoping we weren't going to get another Inhumans or something as that kind of just faded into the background for me, like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or something that was just, couldn't hold up under its own weight, like Daredevil or Iron Fist or one of those things. No, capers, we have got a genuinely, honestly, fantastic TV series with WandaVision. Oh my god, it's so good! I every episode was it just worked with the last. It just built on itself so well. It it had such a weird but like slow start, but it was still so good. And like you watch the first two episodes, and you're like, "What the hell am I watching?" I feel like I'm watching I Love Lucy reruns. And the next thing you know, it's like it's like this whole oh, I I I have so much to say. Let's keep going. <laughs> And, well, don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> fucking go. But I, I, I should, it, be, it behooves me, I love saying that, behooves, it behooves me to point out that I will not have the same sitcom cultural uh, understanding of background that you might have, Francisco, or other people might have, because I grew up watching British sitcoms. I mean, I watched things like Friends and How I Met Your Mother and things like that, but I haven't seen that many classic American sitcoms. I actually, uh, about halfway through WandaVision, I did go on um, Amazon Prime and watch an episode of The Dick Van Dyke Show, where Dick Van Dyke does not play Dick Van Dyke. He plays a, a completely... <laughs> that's the thing I think I've noticed with a lot of American sitcoms. They have, like, The Mary Tyler Moore Show or The, the Dick Cavett Show. No, The Dick Cavett Show was a, um, was a talk show. Whatever. Uh, but they, they have the actor's name show, but they won't actually be playing themselves or indeed a completely separate character with their own name. They'll be playing just a completely different character. The The show isn't named after that character. The one exception to that is something much more recent. 
Uh, Keenan Thompson has this new show called Keenan, where he plays not Keenan Thompson, but Keenan something else. I've seen like two episodes. Yeah. Eh. It became it became more of a prominent thing in the nineties. Uh, I I forgot who did it. I think it was Will Smith with Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and his well, character was named Will, but it wasn't the same <laughs> last name. And ever since then, people were like, "Wait, we can do that? Let's do that. That's way easier." <laughs> I think I think his name was Will Smith in that. Was it Will Smith? I thought it was. Oh, I remember. I remember this when I was a kid seeing a clip of, and I was like, "Oh, that's Will Smith," because I'd seen Men in Black, and and he was on the phone with something. Is like, "Hi, it's me." Your son, Will Smith. Oh, wow. Well. I, <laughs> I just... I, 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 I Maybe misremembering that, but that's what I remember. Yeah, I just remember characters being named after themselves a lot in the 90s. Because like you said, Keenan Thompson actually had Keenan and Kel. And Kel oh, and yes. And Keenan Thompson, and they had different names. I forget Keenan and Kel. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Keenan and Kel. <laughs> I love Orange Soda too. I miss that show. Let, let's reboot that. That's that's what we need to do. Reboot that. I don't no. <laughs> bring just bring let's bring Will back. Cool <laughs> Wherever <laughs> he is now, wake him up from his from his slumber and tell him to come do music for us. Now, kids, let's see if Coolio notices his own shadow. Because if we do, it's six more weeks of Coachella. Oh my god! Uh. So. Anyway, anyway, so uh, some stuff may, I mean, I understand, like, because I've seen clips and through cultural context and cultural osmosis, I understand some aspects of things like, oh, that's a reference to Bewitched, or that's something like uh, Mary Tyler Moore or uh, Dick Van Dyke, but I don't have all the context. So that's why I'm glad you're here, Francisco. Hopefully you'll be able to help me out with that. I will try my best. I've seen quite a few of the shows that they reference, so I'm pretty happy. So I think we should just dive right in. We're going to go through it episode by episode. And (laughs) the first episode, oh my God. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, because I've read the comics, I understand that Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, has reality bending powers. Sometimes though, in my um, entitlement, I forget that a lot of new fans who are just as valid as old fans, I am not a gatekeeper, I want to be clear on that, uh, new fans who just know about Wanda through the movies might not know about Wanda's reality-bending powers. So when they see Wanda and Vision in a sitcom, they might think, you know, what the fuck? And, and so I kind of love watching the show, thinking about their reaction. Was that your reaction? Yeah, it was It was so interesting because I, I knew going in that she was going to do the creating realities. And the, I didn't know to what scale, but I knew that something crazy was going to happen. And uh, my wife, who was watching with me, had no idea what was going on. And she's like, why are they in a sitcom? And I was like, watch it, just watch it. I I I need to see you blind on this and need to see what happens <laughs> next. Because I think the extent of what she knew was the MCU stuff and and that she was and then in the comics she's Magneto's daughter. And that's about as much as she knew. And so she's like watching like, okay, so she she did this? Who did this? Who's doing <laughs> And so it's it's so interesting. Who's to doing see. this to you, Wanda? Who's doing this to you? Yeah, and I'm I'm glad that that was uh, like I, a feeling that was matched through the show where people couldn't figure out what was going on. I watch a few people on YouTube reacting to the show who don't have that co- context, and it's just like, wait, what's going on? I'm so confused. And then the little hints start appearing. And that's one thing I love about this show is this sense of forward progression. Uh, it, it manages its time very effectively. And I think that's because the episodes are relatively short. Oh, we're going to do hour-long episodes later on in the season. Of course you are, Marv. Of course you are. And so, yeah, we start in this classic 1950s sitcom universe where Wanda and Vision have just moved to Westview, New Jersey. And they're all... 
I was never going to be able to use that clip until now. I had to. I, t- I saw an opportunity and I took it. And they're not just like, oh my god, we're trapped in this sitcom world. Like, it's Pleasantville or something. No, no, no. It's like their characters are their classic cheesy 1950s, less abusive honeymooners sitcom. And it's, I mean, delightfully twee. I think it's the best way of describing it. I know, it's it's weird, because you just jump right in, and they have no idea what's going on, and you're trying to figure out who knows about this, and or who can figure anything out. And I love the commitment to the bit. I think that that's what I, or I mentioned that I really enjoyed about it, is that they went all out with this. Uh, as far as production, mm. as far as everything goes, like the fact that they did the first two episodes in black and white is amazing to me. I think that that was such a, a cool decision. I feel really bad for Paul Bethany, who had to wear red, even though he was in black and white for two whole episodes. He had to go through four hours of makeup every day to not be shown in color was one of the funniest things to me. <laughs> um, I mean, that that is absolute commitment. He got a little bit of a... He got uh, a little of a break every now and then when he switched between his human disguise and the his uh, default vision thing. But the thing that really stuck out to me was... The acting, because I was really worried they were going to give Paul Bettany a really fake American accent, like, hi, honey, I'm home. But they don't do that. It's just a normal accent. But then you've got Elizabeth Olsen. (laughs) Whose Sokovian accent just (laughs) appears and reappears at will. It's the most powerful part of her magic. (laughs) (laughs) But it just like, she talks exactly like how I would imagine a 1950s sitcom wife would talk it's it really grounds you in this fake reality which is which makes it all the more disturbing when that reality changes as the show goes on and the thing that really got me was the effects they use to display their magical abilities i mean it looks cheap on purpose they have like the plates on strings or something it's so cool it's it's amazing i it's it's the absolutely bewitched parody that we never knew we wanted yeah and that brings up a good good point actually why did they decide to do it like this you know that's a good question i i i would have no idea why they decided to do it like this but i would say that whoever's idea it was it was a great one i think that one way to go into reality is by going into sitcoms and just doing like a television breakdown and that way you can just do a bunch of eras. And then, uh, you know, I know I'm jumping ahead quite a bit, but like, and then we find out at the end that it has to do with her family. And she watched all these sitcoms and it's like a nod to that. And I, it's such an interesting concept, but it was so well executed, especially going into episode two when they have the magic show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh god, I mean I mean this has been in development since 2018 and in 2019, early 2019, Jacqueline Schaefer was uh taken on as the head writer of the series and it seems like she's the one who took a like a lot of um the creative drive for the show. And uh, she's one of the people who came up with the title Wonder Vision, which apparently a lot of people didn't like, but still so I guess maybe we have her to thank for it. I mean, there was, uh, a lot of the episodes were directed by uh, Matt Shankman, but uh, Jack Schaefer was the one who wrote a lot of the episodes, produced a lot of the episodes. So who knows? But it's such a stroke of genius, I think. Because it's... Well, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it more as we go on. For the first episode, though, uh, despite moving into the idyllic new home and getting to know their new neighbour, uh, Agnes, played by uh, Catherine Hahn. Incredibly played by Catherine Hahn. Oh, my God. She oh, she yeah. sold me on that. She she did such a good job. Hmm. And But they discover written on the calendar is a little heart. Oh, no. What could that mean? And that's the episode. These two characters, Wanda and Vision, try to figure out, oh my god, what does the heart mean? It turns out it means that that means the boss, their boss, Mr. Hart and his wife, uh, are going to (laughs) 
join them for dinner. And it's the classic sitcom trope. The boss is coming to us for dinner, but we're not prepared. Oh, no. And and I should mention that the, the boss's wife is played by uh, Kitty from uh, That 70s Show. So if anybody got that, that's amazing. I'm so glad she joined them. I mean, she's uh, Deborah Jo Rupp was awesome in that 70s show. I, that's another show I really did like. Right up until the very end. Seriously, you lost like half the cast and thought you could keep on going. You got greedy, producers. You got greedy. And But it, it's so cool because you think, oh, Deborah Jo Rupp, sitcom. That's the thing we most associate with her with outside of Friends, which she was also in. So, so that puts us very much in the sitcom mindset. It's like, okay, I can fully accept that these two characters are now in a sitcom and everything seems to be going well until Mr. Hart starts choking on something at dinner and Mrs. Hart does not have the reaction you think he would. And Deborah Jo Rubb just starts not yelling, but sort of smiling while also being quite disturbed, saying, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And I'm just sitting here, curled up, just thinking to myself, oh no, this is much worse. And that's when you realise, oh shit, something is rotten in the state of Denmark, this is not good. And Vision has to put his hand inside the guy's throat in order to get the dis- the food out. Mmm, gross! Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think he knows the Heimlich. <laughs> Which I feel would have worked easier. I mean, if you have phasing powers, wouldn't you use it like that? Like, this is easier, <laughs> sploosh. <laughs> and then everyone just sort of goes back to normal and they act like nothing happened. Until we sort of pan out to see that someone is watching all of this on a modern day television. And that's how the first episode ends. Oh my god! It's it, it's, it's such a mystery. I'm, I'm really glad that they released the first two together. Uh, because if that was the first week and I was just sitting there for a week, I, I it's, it's insane. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's. I, I'm also glad they did that, but also I'm glad they did those just those two, first two because they're the ones that are the most that they drop some hints about what's going to come, but it's still the ones that take the most uh, direct references to uh, all the sitcom tropes and are the most grounded in this sitcom world. And I also like, I mean, some people have criticized these first two episodes for being a little bit slow and not dropping a lot of hints. But you know what? They've got 10 episodes and they're using them however they fucking like. And what they're doing is, is they are establishing tone, atmosphere, and also this sense of dread, which is excellent because they're in this highly sanitized, highly polished, highly happy dappy 1950s and then 1960s sitcom world. You can only drop so much grim foreshadowing in before it becomes overbearing. They've got plenty of episodes left to sort that all out. Right now, they are establishing stuff. This is a slow burn, people, and they do it fantastically. And and I also got to say, I really... As much as I like binge watching, I really appreciate that this show was released weekly. Oh because yeah, it it really helped build the show up. It, every week, jo- I miss that about just being able to discuss TV, about just being able to go in and be like, "Hey, what do you think is going to happen next?" and "What do you think this character?" and really doing a deep dive of every episode within the week, and then watching what actually unfolds. That Game of Thrones, I'm, I'm Twin glad. Peaks, water cooler moment. Yeah, I'm so glad that they're bringing back weekly releases, and and it's so it was so good. <laughs> I, it, it was it was great because it's the best kind of frustrating for me because I've been spoiled with all all this entertainment at my fingertips, ready for me to binge, 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 binge. Um, but stretching out over, over those weeks, you're absolutely right, and it's very much like sitcoms should be. Spread out over 
a long period, except this is a sitcom with an overarching storyline. And, and that uh, second episode, we then transition to the 1960s, where we actually get a different theme song. It's all based around WandaVision. But it's <laughs> now it's, the, it's a 1960s bewitch sort of thing with a little bit of animation and which is really cool. It's like, oh, so we are definitely moving forward. Because he knew a bit that it was going to move forward thanks to the uh, marketing for the show, which still actually was very restrained as marketing went. It it really was. It, it didn't show a lot. And then when it did show anything, it was scattered scenes. Like we saw the Halloween episode a lot. Hmm. And then we saw them fighting for Westview in the last episode. But even that was just like, we're fighting for our home. And then you just see them and you see nothing else. And it's like, okay, I have no idea any direction you can go from here. Yeah. And and this it just it speaks to the creativity of the series. I swear we're just going to be gushing for this entire episode. But in, in fairness, I, I mean, have we ever seen a... a a show that has done this sort of homage parody um, sort of meta thing in such a focused, but also short form way. Like you could argue community has done similar things, but not with this amount of focus. It, it, I have it. I I've seen, I've seen shows do one episodes or when they do something like this, like I, I instinctively remember uh, there's an episode in Supernatural they did something like this, and I'm not by any means very supernatural to this, but, <laughs> but there is an episode of Supernatural where they do uh, kind of like a sitcom thing and they play around with that idea for an episode. But even that is one episode and its own storyline, and it only delves into that. But in WandaVision, it's it's really it, it's important to talk about because. If it has been done before, it's not been done this well, first of no. all. And and it's the fact that they can completely change up the style every single episode and the story itself isn't changing. It's And what's it's great so about it is good. it's so great. And what's great about it is it doesn't feel like it's mocking these tropes. It doesn't feel snarky. It doesn't feel like, oh, remember how shitty things used to be? It feels like it's made out of love. It feels like it's a great homage to American, not just sitcoms, but also American television and even American culture over the past 50, 60, 70 years. I, I think it's important to note that simply because it shows the progression. It shows the changes uh, over all of these episodes. And... Admittedly, I, I again because I don't have a, a great grounding in fifties and sixties sitcoms. I it took me a little while to realize, oh, this is set in the nineteen sixties rather than nineteen fifties, like the last one. If I wasn't even sure if the ninth, the the first one was set in the nineteen fifties, just because I'm that much of a philistine. I'm sorry, I'm not a historian, Francisco. <laughs> God, but. It was. I could still tell that there was a progression going forward, and uh, indeed, in this next episode, Wonder and Vision, it starts out so classic. They're in separate beds because in the 1960s you couldn't show a married couple in the same bed. What are you, some kind of delinquent pervert? I I love that they're in the. I love that they're in separate beds. I love the stupid outfits that they always have Vision in. <laughs> With the pants up to like his nipples and and ah oh, that that made me laugh. And then Wanda's always rocketed. She's always dressed so well. <laughs> she I, I mean people forget that Paul Bettany does have a background in comedy. He hasn't done a lot of comedy films and stuff, but he is well versed in it. He's a very good actor. I mean, I think the first thing most of us saw him in was A Knight's Tale. Have you seen that movie? Oh, I adore that movie. It's so good. It's so good. About the first time we see Paul Bettany in that movie, for many people, the first introduction to him as an actor is him walking bare ass naked down the road as Jeffrey Chaucer. It was. It was so. And then his whole speeches throughout that movie, his comedy speeches. Like, we walk uh, in the garden of his turbulence. The protector of Italian virginity. 
And then I'm like, any actor who can say that in a movie is awesome. It's just great. <laughs> oh, and he brings the full force of his comedic uh, weight to bear in this show, but doesn't overplay it. It'd be so easy for him to mug. And he does that a little bit, but he just sprinkles it in. You know, it's, I mean, this episode is all about him trying to join the neighborhood watch because he hears like this mysterious noise outside. Ooh, what could it be? But uh oh, we've got to prepare for the talent show. Oh my God. Saying that out loud. It's so silly. <laughs> I, I also love the concept of the most powerful sentient weapon in the world <laughs> joining the neighborhood watch. <laughs> it just, it just cracked me up every time. Uh. Yeah, and meanwhile, uh, Wanda has to contend with uh, Dottie, like the neighbourhood queen bee, played by Emma Caulfield of Buffy fame. She's been in lots of other things, but still, we mostly know her from Buffy. So cool that she's in there, because she needs to be in more things. Emma Caulfield's a great actor. And <laughs> it's so cool that this is like... Okay, this is the antagonist of the show, I guess. This slightly snarky neighborhood curtain twitcher. Okay, sure. Uh, But then more weird things start to happen. Like a voice coming through on the radio, her not noticing that she's bleeding. Wonder who's doing this to you. Wonder who's doing this to you. Oh, God. And she, she... and then she bleeds in color. I mean, have you ever... I mentioned it earlier. Have you ever seen that movie Pleasantville? Yes, with uh, Tobey Maguire, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I'm sorry that I keep on asking if you've seen these really obvious movies. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. It's been quite a while for that one, though. Yeah, but uh, it utilizes... I mean, that's the only other thing I could think of that does something similar to this. Uh, but the, uh, the only difference is between that movie and this this show is that this is featuring characters that we've seen in other things. Like, we hadn't seen Tobey Maguire and who was the other person in? Not Alicia Silverstone. Um, oh, who cares? Uh, we hadn't seen them in everything else. We just thought that these were two brand new characters for this movie. So see, it's, it's seeing Wanda and Vision in this stereotypical Pleasantville sitcom world, combined with all these weird foreshadowing elements that makes us think, okay, something really weird is going on here. But then we're immediately distracted by the fact that Vision gets gum in his works. I, <laughs> I, I love that entirely too much. The fact that he was stopped by gum, the fact that that was an entire plot line, <laughs> the fact that he acted drunk Paul Bettany really went all out that episode, and I that is one thing I wish we had seen a little bit more of was silly Paul Bettany. <laughs> it was just the silly vision being goofy. Because after that, he starts becoming more serious every episode as he starts to figure out that there's something wrong. But the, the drunk magic show <laughs> was incredible. I just seeing Wanda desperately trying to cover up for him as... It all goes to pot is it's fantastic. And you it's know It's all mirrors. It's all I don't mirrors. Think that's how mirrors work. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, it's so cool. I don't something actually we all, we also forgot to mention is both in this episode and all of the episodes actually, um it, halfway through there's a commercial for fake products featuring the same actors. And in the previous one, it was um, Stark Industries toasters. This one, it's uh, Hydra watches or something. It's yeah, hi- Hydra <laughs> thousand meter watches. I remember that, which actually I looked mean, pretty cool. I buy them. I don't care if it, it's funding a fascist paramilitary science death cult organization. Who cares? They look styling anyway. Uh, Wanda manages to get the gum out of Vision's gears and, you know, they, they're a rousing success of the talent show and they go home and everything is, seems all fine until Wanda reveals, oh my God, I'm preggers! Immediately preggers. It's wild how 
Well, six months pregnant? With the, I think <laughs> that, kind of step- that's about as in-depth as 1960s sitcoms were allowed to get regarding pregnancy. And... <laughs> But the happy news is somewhat thwarted when they hear that noise from the beginning of the episode outside. They go outside to investigate, and out from a sewer pops up a man in a beekeeper uniform with a mysterious symbol on his back with a sword and a circle. And Wanda's like, no. Rewinds time and makes it so that it never happened. And the episode just continues on and ends like everything is fine. Everything is good until colour comes to the sitcom. Wanda makes everything colourful and we transition to a 1970s aesthetic. Which brings us to the next episode, which is everything's now in the 1970s. The clothes have changed. Paul Bettany's got sideburns. It's all awesome. Oh, it's I I really I really enjoyed this episode as part of like a whole and the whole beekeeper thing had me completely confused. I couldn't understand a lot of it. I just it, this honestly I was I was hooked from the start. Yeah, because it all makes sense in context, and the show does explain why all this is happening. So it's like, oh, that's why that happened. There are no loose ends, but it's one of those things where there's two ways of doing this sort of foreshadowing sort of thing Uh, in a way that makes it sort of obvious that uh, about what's going on and the kind where you have absolutely no freaking clue what's going on. And that's part of the fun. And aside from knowing that Wanda is doing something deliberately to make the world this way, we have no fucking clue what's going on. Why is there a beekeeper coming out of the fucking sewers? We don't know, and the show is not keen on telling us anytime soon. So there's no real... It's not like a murder mystery where you, the audience, could piece together exactly what's happened. I'm sorry, Tony Shalou, but it's so obvious who it was. It was that guy. You should know it. Your monk. I like monk, but goddamn, I'm in the, like, the third season now, and it's becoming a tad predictable. I knew Sharona shouldn't have left, but anyway... Cheers to the three middle-aged women listening to this show who get that reference. Does anyone else watch Monk? Do you watch Monk? I I saw it in the very early stages, and I haven't seen it in quite a long time. I like it when it's not being predictable. Anyway, 1970s. Wanda is visibly pregnant in a very short time frame. The doctor's checking around. It's like, no, you seem uh, absolutely fine. Just be sure to get plenty of rest. Also, side note, I'm going on holiday. So don't have the baby too soon. (laughs) I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit. And while Vision is seeing the doctor out, he sees his neighbor Herb, who's been a recurring character in the show, um, cutting through a concrete wall with his hedge trimmer. He's like, huh. That's a. Uh, that's weird. People don't do that, right? I don't know. Just, just going for it. Really trimming those walls. <laughs> Make sure they don't grow out of control. And then he starts talking to him, and then that's when Agnes appears, right? Yeah, Agnes appears, and uh, well, she's she keeps on popping up because she's like the nosy neighbor. And Catherine Hahn does a great job of that. But also another character that appeared uh, in the beginning or around about the uh, second episode, was this character of Geraldine, who uh, walks in on Wanda while she's pregnant. It's like, oh, Wanda, you're pregnant. Also, you appear to be given birth. Hmm. This this is this is news. Oh, God. <laughs> and, oh, God, this whole episode is just centered around... Well, it's two, there's two things. Vision wondering what exactly is going on with the world, and also... Wanda giving birth to two boys. And before she gives birth, they're talking about uh, names. And Vision is just like, I like Billy. And Wanda's like, I like Tommy. And I'm thinking, (gasps) That's the name of her kids in the comics! Oh my god! I was was so excited. As soon as I heard that, I was like shaking. But I knew that that they weren't going to... I was like, no, there's no way. There's no way. There's no way. (laughs) 
I mean, thank God. Uh, in the past year or so, I actually bothered to read Young Avengers, so I had the proper context for this. Children's Crusade, what's going on with that, geez? But yeah, in the comics, Wanda uh, had two kids that were not real, but then were real. It's very confusing. Um, called Billy and Tommy, and it's revealed in later episodes, after they get born, that they have the powers they have in the comics. And I'm just thinking, oh my god, we've already got Cassie, aka Stature, from Young Avengers. Are we just building up to Young Avengers? Is that gonna happen? And it's at this point, where almost every episode, at the end of the episode at least, it left me with this feeling like, Dear God, there's more. No. Just so much references and reveals and it's just every episode is just like oh my god i feel so seen and validated as a fan because they did they did not need to call the characters names billy and tommy they could have gotten away with calling them something else but they didn't because i guess they're doing like the star wars thing where they've hired a guy whose job it is to learn all the lore of star wars and tell people that's non continuity that's non continuity that's cool that's not a continuity that's okay trick it a little bit i don't know something like that it should i imagine is going on uh so she gives birth to tommy and billy meanwhile vision is unaware of this, and is talking with Agnes and Herb about Geraldine. And they're like, hey, so is Geraldine uh, really someone we want around? What do you mean? Well, you know, she has no home. What does that mean? Oh, you know, just yeah. And it's like, and this is what I love about the show, because we think that Wanda's in control, but now we're wondering like, okay, so what exactly is the full, like, is anything else going on here? And this is where I thought that this whole thing might have been some kind of Matrix-esque simulation where everyone was an actor. That turns out not to be the case. But it, <laughs> that's what I love about the show. It keeps you guessing. Yeah, and it it it, it caught me completely by surprise that they were doing this. It, it... Because I just, I was like, Wanda has to know everything that's going on. There's no way she doesn't know if this is her part. And then I was like, okay, maybe somebody's doing this to her. And then when we cut back in the house and the kids are born, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and now reality starts to break because Wanda just gave birth. And Things just, you know, there, there was a bunch of things in the episode where she was making storks appear, she was creating life, and she was doing other things and things like that. But then comes the big question from Geraldine, which is, you know, Otron. Your brother was killed by Otron. And then all of a sudden, the episode just stops for me. I was like, did she just say Otron? She just said Otron. Because uh, uh. Wanda mentions like, oh, I gave birth to twins and I'm a twin. Yeah, your brother was killed by Ultron. Uh And then Wanda notices that Geraldine is wearing a sword a pendant album, which I didn't recognize at first. But then I went back to the previous episode and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Uh! And the same as the, the beekeeper and the, and the helicopter she found. Oh, yeah. We forgot to mention she found a toy helicopter that was, was that in color. I think that, yeah, that was in color. Yeah. The helicopter was in color, but it matched the, the time. Yeah. It matched the, it matched the, the 50s or the 60s. And so Vision goes back into the house and it's like, oh, where's Geraldine? Oh, she uh, had to go home. And then we see outside of Westview, beyond this strange, staticky, television-y barrier, Geraldine is flung fr out of Westview and is suddenly surrounded by agents while Daydream Believer by the Monkeys plays. <laughs> oh my god, what's going on now? And this is where a lot of the pieces start to fall into place. The next episode... Also, like, can we talk about... um the episode titles. The first episode is called Film Before a Live Studio Audience. Second episode, Don't Touch That Dial. Third episode, Now in Colour. And the fourth episode, We Interrupt This Program. I, there's All the episode titles have names like that. Just these cute little references to TV uh, vernacular. And 
I, I, it's just another level of detail that I really like. Yeah, they, they really, and it, it has to do, it has to do with the episode two, which I really like. They actually framed it around the titles. It's not just a thing, and hmm. uh, it's, it was, sur- it was surprising how, I don't know, I don't want to say how much care, but it was surprising how much Marvel committed to this idea, considering that what we've seen from Marvel so far has been a lot of action. And this show is completely not that. This show is so far away from the action. It's all, I think we see a little bit in the last episode. And that is it. I mean, a lot of it in the last episode, but it, it's such a big commitment to television. It's such a big commitment to this. And that's the thing that has me worried going forward is I really hope that they can a- they're able to reproduce something like this in season two, but I have no idea how they would do this again. Well, that's the thing. See, are we going to get a season two? Because, <laughs> I mean, I honestly would be perfect. I actually think it would be best not to do a season two because uh, we're going to see Wanda again in the Doctor Strange movie. And uh, we're not going to talk about what happens to Vision just yet. But I see, I honestly... Can- <laughs> The only way they could go back to... What made this show special was all the sitcom homages, references, and in-universe meta-commentary. And the only way to do that again would be to start this whole thing up again. And at this point, like, it's been done. It's best we just move on. So I, as much as I want to see Wanda again, and we will see Wanda again, uh, I don't think... One division should return, at least not in the same way. But anyway, see episode four. Uh, this is one of the episodes that does not take place within the Wanda Vision alternate reality, as it were. We start with Monica Rambo, the daughter of Maria Rambo, previously seen in uh, Captain Marvel, getting unsnapped uh, and coming back to life. On the ground as everyone is coming back to life in a hospital. And it's a really fast-paced emotional scene with people just coming back to life, people going crazy, hospital workers desperately trying to scramble to make everything get... So I I got to call out this scene because this is the scene that, that I've been waiting for ever since... Uh, Spider-Man Far From Home because the I can't imagine anything more terrifying than the, the whole end game thing. Like people get snapped and they come back. And then you see a little bit of the effects on the world when Paul Rudd comes back and he sees like the creepy, like deserted neighborhoods and things. Yeah. And then Spider-Man didn't say anything about it. They're just like, okay, we were gone and now we're back and whatever. We got used to it. And yeah. then WandaVision which should be mentioned that Spider-Man actually takes place after WandaVision happens. Because it's he's months after the snap. He's months after they come back. WandaVision is two weeks. Oh, yes. That's a good point. So, so they've had more time to adjust. So keep in mind that Wanda and Geraldine, now Monica Rambo, is have only been out snapped for two weeks. They've only been back for two weeks. But I just love how dark it is. It's it has to be dark. People are coming back from the dead. People have moved on with their lives. People have grieved. The world has adjusted in five years without half of the population there. And now they're all back. And that scene in the hospital was horrifying. I couldn't have, I think I would have just quit if I worked at a hospital. I think I would have just gone home from the thing. <laughs> Now the dead are coming back. I just got used to all of them being dead. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm sorry. Goodbye. I don't get paid enough for this. Especially not in the United States. You don't get paid enough for this. Hey, not over. Okay, so over here, uh, government said that they uh, would consider giving a pay rise to medical professionals. They did not do that. They did give a pay rise to some politicians, though. So that's. Fucking oh, yeah, fant- they need it. Yeah, fucking fantastic. I mean, I'm not going to go into rant about the state of uh, UK politics right now. It's fucking dire. But anyway, but yeah, so this scene is fantastic. And Monica's like, okay, where's my mom? I was just with my mom. Where's my mom? And it turns out that Maria uh, died of cancer three years ago. Oh, shit. 
it's <laughs> it it's it's a really um, just imagine that dying, coming back to life, only to find out the person you love that has gone through such trauma died of cancer. It's it's a real gut punch, and at, actually, it's a, it's about um. At least according to the thing I'm looking at here, it says it's three weeks later, not two weeks. But that's just another week, so you know it's still not that much. But it turns out Monica followed into her mum's footsteps somewhat by joining Sword. Uh, I can't remember what that acronym stands for. Uh, oh, here, here it is: Sentient Weapon Observation and Response Division, uh, which first appeared in a. Um, in one of the X Men comics, a lot of things are clunking on your end. I'm hearing a lot of Pardon? I'm hearing a lot of bashing and I yeah that I just heard it just again. Oh, I think it's me on the desk. I will I will try to stop. <laughs> sorry, that. <laughs> sorry, just a little bit distracting. Anyway, uh, so seeing that previously in X Men comics, they're like shield, but for space, as I understand them. Yeah, in the comics, they're not sanctioned weapon. They're like, they're they're something else. It's it's just they're the space kind. Uh, the sanctioned, it's not sanctioned weapon in, in the comics. It's sanctioned world observation and response. So, it, they're it's a little bit different, but they basically it's it's what I guess Nick Fury's been doing. Yes, because he, we he's been stuck up in space with the Skrulls on holiday. Which I I enjoy that the scrolls are good guys right now. I yeah. and I'm enjoying that a lot. Because I mean I don't know I kind of like in the comics the fact that the scrolls and the Kree were at war, but neither of them was the good guy. Like there were heroes and villains on both sides, but ultimately these are both two very destructive cultures just going at it. But I I do like that in the MCU the scrolls are the good guys because they're very enjoyable characters. So that that is fun. Uh, but so Monica goes back to S.W.O.R.D. after taking three weeks off to grieve her mum and adjust to the fact that, oh, I was dead. Hmm. <laughs> and she goes to the acting director, Taylor Haywood, who says, OK, so you're grounded for the moment, but that's just because that's what your mum said we should do. So don't shoot the messenger. There is something, however, I could use your help with. This thing going over in New Jersey. Hop over there, see what's going up. She goes over there and immediately is met by Jimmy Woo, who uses a magic oh. trick. I am so happy that he's back. I am so happy that he's back. <laughs> it's, oh God. And not only is it so cool to see Randall Park back as Jimmy Woo, because Jimmy Woo was one of the characters that I wanted to see in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I wanted him to be the cool, badass martial arts character he is in the comics. Uh, that didn't, <laughs> um, yeah, that didn't work out. No. <laughs> so, but it was so cool to see him in Ant-Man and it's so cool to see him back here as well. Cause Randall Park's a good actor and he's actually good at both the comedy and the drama in this series, but just, yeah. I knew it was going to be good. That first scene where he sleight of hands, the business card <laughs> out of his wrist. Cause it, it'd be, it'd, they gave this character a heck of a lot of development in literal seconds of his first introduction in the show. Have we seen that before? I don't think so. God. It, they're, they're really trying, and it's amazing what he's done. Because we remember in that man, him trying to like just figure out what the hell's going on. And I also love the, Connor, the, the juxtaposition of him doing a little magic trick. With people like Wanda running around five feet away, <laughs> I was literally creating her reality. And he's like, "Well, I can do card tricks. Let's see how I can help this issue." <laughs> do you know what I want? I want, considering I've had so many great ideas lately, I want an X Files style series with Jimmy Woo, possibly someone else, uh, maybe a lesser known Marvel character. Put that in, and they just go around America solving weird crimes for the FBI. That would be amazing. I I wish I wish that uh, Agents of Shield hadn't completely tainted my idea of Marvel spinoffs. 
Well, I mean, if Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't going to do it, then Hellstrom certainly would. Oh, I mean, is anyone watching Hellstrom? I know it's shit, but is anyone watching it? I honestly didn't think it had come out. <laughs> it, it has. No one noticed because everyone saw the first trailer and thought, wow, that looks stupid. Because like Hellstrom is possibly one of the least remembered, uh, lower ranked Marvel characters. Like, oh, he's Damien Hellstrom, son of the devil. Is he Blade? No. Is he Morbius? No. Is he Elsa Bloodstone? No. Is he Ghost Rider? No. Then why should we care? You're like, who's watching this series? Who's requesting this? Reminds me of the, they made the, the Jonah Hex movie. And I'm like, you have decades of decades of comic books to choose from. And the hero you want to do is Jonah Hex? Who adds Jonah Hex? Actually, you know, <laughs> Jonah Hex has a lot much better standing for his own standalone movie than Hellstrom has for his own TV show. But even then, it's like, really, DC, that's what you want to go with? And then they completely fuck that up by giving him superpowers that he doesn't have in the comics. But that's a whole other thing. Anyway, uh, this episode, she meets Jimmy Woo. They explain, like, okay, this is Barry going around Westview. The town has disappeared. Everything within it is just gone. And we don't know why. And we call it the Hex because it's like in a hexagon type uh, field. And Monica's just like, cool, I'm going to touch it. It's a very stupid idea, Monica. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Oh, and she's pulled in. Well, that's great. She's not the best secret agent. She's not. <laughs> I I thought that the same thing when she brought up Ultron in front of Wanda while wearing the symbol of her organization. I'm like, maybe she's, I don't think she's suited for field work very much. I mean... Yeah, it does seem pretty stupid, and it just seems like a way of getting her into the action. If that seems like a cop out to you, congratulations! You get a cookie. So now she's stuck in there, and Wu's just like, oh shit, I need to call him back up. And back up comes in the form of Darcy Lewis. I never expected to see. Uh, I can never remember the actors who plays her. Uh, uh, Kat Dennings. Kat Dennings. I never expected to see Kat Dennings in another Marvel thing again because she wasn't in Ragnarok. And you know what? Fuck you, people. I liked her character in the other Thor films. I thought she was funny. I, yeah, I agree. I thought that she was a good levity, especially because Dark World was atrocious. And like any scene where I didn't have to deal with Dark Elves <laughs> was also <laughs> amazing. As one of the few people who does not hate the Dark World, but does acknowledge it has some problems. Boo! (laughs) Like, the villains are crap, but there's other aspects that are fine. Not great, but fine. Anyway, it was so cool to see her back in here, because it turns out they've got a bunch of experts in. And now since... And that's what I love about the MCU, is that... They have this real sense of thought progression. People do move on with their lives. And Darcy is now a doctor of astrophysics and is indeed considered an expert enough to bring in, with, be brought in by sword to examine it, this whole hex thing. And she discovers the broadcast signal, signals for WandaVision using an old television. She teams up with Wu. They make, actually, you know what? Maybe she should be on the Jimmy Wu TV show. They should go around America fixing problems. What else is she doing right now? I don't know. She's not on Two Broke Girls anymore. Thank God. So, And so they discover, oh my God, all the people in this world have been turned into sitcom characters. And... Monica has apparently... This is the thing. This is the thing. Has Monica disguised herself as Geraldine? Or has she been, um, like, mind-warped into thinking she's Geraldine? Uh, she... She basically got mind... She got mind-warped as soon as she went in. Like, everything changes. She... I, I think one of the things that they mention is that they know in their head... Who they are, they just can't act against that. 
Okay, and she but she managed to to do that briefly when she confronts a wonder about Ultron, and that's why that happened. Because because she just gave birth, and her powers are going crazy. Yes. So, and then we get a lot of uh, hints as to what's been going on the previous three episodes. Uh, that radio broadcast in the second episode, that was Jimmy Woo trying to use the radio to contact Wanda. The beekeeper, that was a guy in a hazmat suit crawling through the sewer, only to immediately become a beekeeper. Whatever happened to that guy? I, I, I think he got launched back. I think that's what it was said, that he just got launched back after she went back in time. Or maybe he's dead. <laughs> or hopefully he's not dead. <laughs> I don't know. I I'm pretty sure though after she like because it's she didn't really rewind time. She she basically retconned went back and then deleted people's memories in the hex. Uh that makes sense. Yeah. So I I don't know why I'm just I'm very concerned about Agent Franklin. I think his name was. Uh. Then, um... Poor Agent Frank. He was only two weeks from retirement. <laughs> In the arms of Agent <laughs> Anyway, and so... They discover irregularities with the broadcasts when Wanda does her little reality-altering thing. It takes the form of censorship. And... Meanwhile, in the sitcom... Wanda, the well, the illusion starts to fade a little bit, and she sees the vision as a kind of zombie robot, which was absolutely creepy. Uh, <laughs> that one really got me. I I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting that because in my head she had brought him back to life, like. At that point, I thought she stole the body and she reanimated the body. And that's what I was thinking happened. But that scene was like, no, he's still dead. This is her creation. This is all in her memory. And I I feel like she's just making up a new vision now. Yeah, and he has no idea what's going on. He's just thinking like, Wanda, is everything okay? Meanwhile, half his face is gone where his skull has been caved in by Thanos. And that's we get. That's when a lot of the pieces have basically formed into place, and then it's revealed that Wanda Tarantinoed—I don't know how else to put it—Tarantinoed Geraldine, aka Monica, out of the sitcom, out of the hex. Sploosh! Out she goes, and then she states later that Wanda is controlling the illusion. Because <gasps> I mean. I thought that that's what was going on, but I didn't know for certain. I'm sure there are plenty of other people that didn't know for certain, but now we knew. And this is what the show is from now on. Now it's not just like, ooh, sitcom tropes. Now it's all about, okay, what's going on here? How can we fix it? And how can we stop all of it? Uh, speaking of stopping, we're going to have to stop a little bit now because we've got some more ads for you coming right up. And we're back. Okay, so this brings us on to episode five. It's now set in the uh, 80s and 90s. It's got a very uh, full house sort of vibe, you know, family ties sort of thing. Are those the right references? I don't know. (laughs) I think so, yeah. (laughs) I, I pride myself on having never seen a single episode of Full House. Really? Yeah. I, I I can't say that I've escaped. I mean, if you watch BoJack Horseman, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the 90s, I was on a very famous TV show. I miss that show. <laughs> I, I've dipped in and out of BoJack Horseman, to be perfectly honest with you. Like, it, it's good. It's fine. It's not necessarily my sort of thing. I don't know. It's the saddest animated show in the world. Oh, it's yeah. So sad. And and credit to it for doing that, but I don't, I, I don't know. It's gotten to the point where I can't really like any of these characters, except for Todd. Todd is a precious asexual baby and must be protected at all costs. Was the character's name Todd? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Played by by oh, I Aaron Paul. Aaron Paul. Yes. That's fantastically played by Aaron Paul. That I I can never get a handle on that guy's career. One minute he's in Breaking Bad, the next BoJack Horseman, and he's excellent in all of them. Yeah. So. Now it's the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and Wanda and Vision are desperately trying to stop their two infant sons from crying. Uh, Agnes pops in every now and then to help look after them, and then appears to break character. And asks, well, should we try that again? And Wanda's like, what? What's going on? And she seems just as confused as everyone else. And this is, this is so interesting, because we know in the comics that Wanda s- suffered a... A mental break of sorts. Her perception of reality really broke down. She was mentally ill. And so we're wondering, is that what's going on here? Like, what exactly is her level of responsibility in this whole thing? We know she is responsible, but how much of it is subconscious and how much of it is conscious? These are the questions that we, the audience, keep asking ourselves. Yeah, and and then it, it also, like, puts in, like, what else is going on and how much control do people outside, how do do people actually have? Because Agnes asking that kind of makes you think, so they know that they have to play the part and they're choosing to play the part or what, what's happened? Do they have no free will? So what is actually going on here? And then vision is just like, wait, what, what's going on? (laughs) It's like, it's like everyone's in a play. A third of the people know the lines Another third know the lines, but for a completely different play. And another third don't know any lines whatsoever. And the director's not get, telling us which one is which. It's it's really fascinating, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but the, but the Wonder and Vision are too distracted by the fact that their sons suddenly age up to five years old. Yeah, immediately. And, and then... Uh... Agnes has a weird line that I remember. Kids can't control them. <laughs> that's that's an accurate reaction to your children aging up five years. Yeah, I mean, is that normal for her perspective? We don't know. And this this from this episode on, we sort of cut in between the sitcom world and the real world. Outside, still watching the anomaly, the hex. Uh, Hayward has come on the scene. And basically says, okay, so we need to be firm and we need to strike hard, strike fast. And Wanda is a terrorist. And everyone else is just like, is she though? Because terrorists usually have political agendas and try to kill people or blow up buildings. And she has no real agenda. Like what she's doing is objectively bad. But what about this? makes her a terrorist. She's like, no, terrorist, evil, bad. And it's, and, and and this is the point where everyone sort of realizes he's an asshole. Oh yeah. He's the douchebag of the week for sure. And, and I, I just want to thank Marvel for um, cranking down on the American stereotypes on this because Hayward does it perfectly. I, (laughs) I love the fear mongering military general. So, Let's let's double down. We we haven't had enough of them. General, these space creatures have come down from the heavens to show us love. They've come here to destroy us. We must strike first. Kill them. Kill them all. That's all he was missing was the cigar. <laughs> oh, God, yes. <yeah. laughs> Dear God, we must send in the Apache helicopters. Anyway, uh, so... And the reason why he thinks that is because he reveals that Wanda has supposedly stolen the Vision's body from S.W.O.R.D. headquarters and resurrected him, which apparently goes against Vision's living will. And I 100% believe that the Vision would have a will, just like just in case. He's a a very pragmatic man, you know. Uh, Furthermore, they discover that Monica's clothing was transformed to match the design of the show, and it was also affected molecule by molecule. So they decide, okay, maybe we could infiltrate the hex by using something that's appropriate to that time period. Meanwhile, back, I keep on saying back in the show. This is the weird thing. We talk about something like meta like this, a show within a show. Yeah. So just when I say WandaVision, I'm referring to the in-universe show. 
and not WandaVision, the show that we want. Even that's confusing. You're not making this easy for me, WandaVision. In the hex, hmm, a dog appears at WandaVision's house. And it's like this sitcom reality is trying to reassert itself of all the weirdness. Just like, okay, the kids are going to get a dog. Hope it doesn't die. Kids ask to keep it. They name it Sparky. And Wanda becomes a bit, shall we say, lackadaisical with her powers in front of Agnes. Uh, Agnes. Agnes. It's w- Ag- Agnes is one of those names that I struggle to say just because it's such a weird combination of vowels and consonants. Yeah, I... I just, I, this, this episode really kind of threw me for a loop because I didn't know what to, that's when I started really doubting Agnes whole, like completely. She was just weird to me in this episode. Yeah. Like, so, so everywhere at once, she was like omnipresent. Um, and the nosy neighbor thing was taken to a whole nother level in here. Like she wasn't just a nosy neighbor. She was just there all the time when the kids aged up when the parents were looking away and and then the dog <laughs> she found the dog sparky like uh yeah uh and things get thrown, thrown for a loop even further when the boys decide that yeah you know what we are too young to care for a dog let's be 10 years old they age up again Meanwhile, Vision at work discovers that he's able to break Wanda's hold over his co-worker Norm, reveals that he's like this real guy named, I think, Avalash? I can't remember. It's like, yeah. you've got to stop her. Oh my God, it's been a living nightmare. Ah, ah, ah. And Vision reasserts Wanda's control over him for some reason. <laughs> what a dick. I don't... <laughs> I... <laughs> He's panicking. I'll just place him back in his mind prison. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. Back to being a helpful old drone. I mean, that's not his... Like, He's trying to figure out what's going on, but yeah, you think like, oh my god, this person has been kept hostage. Maybe I shouldn't put him back? I don't know. Um, meanwhile, S.W.O.R.D. does manage to send a drone into the 1980s, and they attempt to kill Wanda on Hayward's orders. And she does not respond kindly to that. She, <laughs> oh God, she busts out of the hex like, Ooh, you suck. Throws the drone back. Well, her accent, or she, uh, the magic brought back her accent when she came out of the hex, which I thought was hilarious. Yep. And she basically says, okay, you guys are going to leave me the fuck alone. Don't believe me. Starts using a voodoo shit on her, on everyone. And <laughs> gets a bunch of people to point guns at Haywood. It's a really... The most Magneto scene ever. Yes! Oh, I love that Magneto nod. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. You don't know what Wanda's mental state is. So... You thought for a second, oh my god, she could kill Hayward right now. And you it's a very tense scene, but she ends up not doing that, goes back into the hex, Sparky runs off, they try and find him, and uh, apparently he got into Agnes's um Azalea bushes, which is actually toxic to dogs, so plant owners slash pet owners be careful of that. And the dog dies. And the twist, like, Mom, bring the dog back to life. You know, like you did, Dad. Oh. And she's like, no, sorry, can't, because death is a part of life. And this is so cool, because it's forcing Wanda to confront her own own hypocrisy. It's... (laughs) I mean, she's just sitting there thinking... Well, this is a kick in the knickers. <laughs> it's oh, and you, and and you could see her thought process. Like, should I? No, I can't. Maybe I could. How much responsibility do I have here? And it's interesting that this episode is called "On a Very Special Episode" because it plays very much like one of those very special episodes. But 
Yeah, and then the the special episode also represents uh, there's going to be a guest star, which is very interesting. Yeah, which because the vision we're about to... Vision uh, confronts Wanda about like, are you controlling people? Because I don't remember what happened to me before coming here. And she's like, no, nothing is anything. Un- nothing's under my control. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how this all got started. Ding dong. Oh, hmm. I wonder who that could be at the door. They open it. We see the back of his head. White hair. Like, blue clothes. Wait. Is is that is that Quicksilver? Is that Pietro? No, it's Evan Peters. <laughs> Running straight out of the X Men. Oh man! Was... I I this is this is one of the few times in the show, and in fairness, it did happen more than once, where I was screaming at the screen, just like, oh my, what? What? You are fucking having a go! It, 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 if, like, if somebody told me and I had never seen this series, I would think it was fan fiction. Like, it just doesn't... And it works, And but I just never thought that Marvel would commit to something like this, and it's amazing that they did. Yep. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! I'm getting flashbacks now to the feelings I felt when I first watched it because it's one of the things where it really makes you question: Are they introducing the multiverse? Are they doing this? Are they doing that? What does this possibly mean? And we do get answers later on in the very next episode, which is uh, set in Wonder Vision in like the late '90s, early 2000s. It's a very much Malcolm in the Middle type thing. Uh, which I love. <laughs> it's a good show. I've seen a few episodes of it. Uh, not that many. Just kind of skipped me. But it's it's really cool. And Evan Peters is such a good actor because he really plays up the whole cool uncle vibe. <laughs> He's just a horrible uncle. He's just a bad influence. <laughs> He's just the worst. Stealing candy from kids. <laughs> And and also, like, Darcy's reaction when she's watching the show, so like, they recast Pietro? <laughs> oh, my God. And that, 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 that's... And he thinks he's Pietro, but here's the thing. Wanda doesn't recognize him. So it's like, what's going on here? But who cares? It's Halloween, and now it's a multi-camera sitcom, so everything's a bit less fixed, so they can go out into the world a bit more. And it's so cool because they dress Billy and Tommy up like their comic book costumes, and everyone gets their comic book costumes. Technically, uh, Wanda gets a Scarlet Witch costume, Vision gets his Vision costume, Pietro gets his Quicksilver costume. <laughs> oh god, and. Oh, the Tommy gets super speed. He's inherited that from that. Oh, there's so much going on in this episode. And he also reveals, Pietro reveals, uh, that he knows that Wanda is controlling the town. And apparently he's fine with it. And he's like, hey, so how'd you do it? How'd you control everything? And she's like, I don't know. I, I don't know how any of this happened. And it's like, oh, and again, is someone doing this to her? Is she doing it herself? She clearly has a lot of control, but is someone using her powers through her? Uh, Vision, meanwhile, is using this opportunity to explore the world. He goes out to the borders of Westview, sees people pantomiming an existence, the sort of the rules of the sitcom world breaking down the further, further out he goes. He tries to restore Agnes to her usual self, and she freaks the fuck out, clearly being quite traumatized, going from shock and horror to fear to laughter. And she reveals to him that he's dead and that Wanda is definitely controlling him. Controlling all of them, sorry. It, I don't know how I expected that, that reveal to happen. This, this show has a really interesting air of like subverting my expectations because... Whenever I expect something to happen one way, they just do it in another. And I really enjoy that about it. I feel like 
And this whole episode is just me gushing over how much I enjoyed WandaVision. I feel like I'm not bringing any commentary other than it was good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, trust me, you brought plenty of commentary, but it is, I mean, that's the thing I found doing this job is that uh, it's much easier to talk about all, yeah, much easier to analyze bad things than it is good things because a good show draws you into the world and you don't really think and stop to analyze it. You're just completely absorbed into this whole universe. So any analyzing you do pretty much after the fact and you just sort of, still in the sort of afterglow of the whole show. It's excellent. Meanwhile, though, um, outside Westview, uh, Hayward is just like, okay, we're going to attack Wanda. And everyone's just like, did that work out well last time? No, it did not. Stop your role, man. He's like, no, go fuck yourselves. I'm throwing you out. They sneak back in. They discover that he's tracking Vision's vibranium signature. And they also discover that Monica has also been changed to the molecular level. And they don't know what going through the boundary of the hex again will do to her. Uh, so Monica and Jimmy go to get some sort of backup. Meanwhile, Darcy stays behind to keep her hacking all of these dirty Hayward secrets. Uh, while this is happening, Vision tries to break through the boundaries of the hex. But once he gets to the other side, he starts to disintegrate. Darcy tries to get Hayward to help him, but she gets handcuffed to a car for her trouble. Billy inherits his mum's, I guess, magic powers, realises that Vision is dying, and Wanda expands the hex after blasting Pietro backwards when he insults Vision, saying, hey, look, because he's going to die again. And the badge now envelops, envelops Vision, Darcy, and a whole bunch of the sword people turning them to circus people, which was fucking creepy. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really weird. And then poor Vision being torn apart. Oh. And then thrown back together somehow. All while uh, Hayward, Monica, and Jimmy managed to escape. Uh, in the very- which- Go on. Sorry, which the, the, the Hayward thing, I can't get over the fact that this guy thinks that a missile in the first place was going to stop an Avenger who put Thanos into submission. Like, come on, man, you're way out of your pay grade here. <laughs> Again, it's the military mindset. I mean, that's the thing you have to remember. In this world, superheroes are a very new thing. Like, the only superhero people knew about was Captain America for years, and then he was only active for like a year or so and then went away forever, and no one really knew about them. But now the military have to contend with the fact that there are super-powered green monsters out there, and they're still trying to get out of that mindset. It's it's very much the same mindset that uh, the generals had in World War One. They just thought, if we build trenches and we keep pushing forward, eventually we're going to win not realizing that they needed to adapt warfare to move around that sort of mindset. And that's why so many people died. And that's why America lost the Vietnam War. Scoreboard! (laughs) Sorry. I I like bringing that up. You guys lost and you know it. That's what happens when you start a legal war. Not that Britain is any better in that regard. I'm no position. I'm such a fucking hypocrite. Anyway... Um. So now the in the next episode, and uh, titled "Breaking the Fourth Wall," we're in a late two thousand setting with the suitably shit intro. Because <laughs> they're going to do all these different intros, but the Wonder Vision it's very it's very much a um, minimalist. You know, just show a bunch of random images very quickly and then get into the episode, sort of thing. Um. And it's sort of very reminiscent of Modern Family because now they're doing the whole interviewing to camera sort of thing, the mockumentary thing, which needs to die. Like, as soon as the Muppets started doing it, I realised this needs to end. <laughs> Let the Muppets have their fun with it, but after they're done, everyone needs to stop. Uh, so, I wonder has sort of had a existential crisis of some sort. She's just like, I'm just going to slob around in my PGs all day. I'm not doing anything. Deal with stuff yourself. Agnes, uh, yeah, the, 
It takes Billy. The pressed Wando is very fun to see just because she's so like laid back and just done with all of this. Too it's, much yeah. shit is happening. I've gone from decade to decade. It takes a lot out of a person, you know? Um, Agnes babysits Billy and Tommy. Tommy? Tommy in her house. And Vision finds Darcy Lewis, frees her from uh, Wanda's control, and they take off trying to get back to Wanda, all while Darcy fills Vision in on everything that's happened since before the hex come up, i.e. him dying. And Wanda starts to lose control of her powers again, and... (sighs) Meanwhile, outside, uh, this is the problem. This is the thing. This is where we've, we've we've officially left the whole sitcom trope thing. Like this, this episode is really the last one that includes any homage to sitcom. From now, from this point on, it starts getting a lot more focused, which I understand because there's only two episodes. It's the last three episodes, and they're only like, like forty minutes or so. So. They they need to have a bit more focused. Outside of Westview, Monica and Jimmy meet with a few Lord loyal sword people and try and get a vehicle that should help cross the barrier, which I want to call them out for doing that because at the end of the last episode, Monica's like, I think we need some friends. And I thought, oh, is she going to get Captain Marvel? No, I guess they couldn't get Brie Larson. So... <laughs> That would be the person I would call with the super pager that Nick Fury has. I think every Avenger, everyone who's involved in the Avengers should get the number to Captain Marvel's pager. And Eventually she'd stop answering, just like, guys, you can't keep calling me every time you've got a bit of a problem. I'm policing the whole universe out here. Jesus. There's a doctor, she's just on call. <laughs> <laughs> So they um, they try and get into the... Monica gets into this vehicle that is supposed to be able to cross the barrier. It can't. So Monica decides to enter herself. And this gives her superpowers somehow. Like, here's the thing. I knew from Captain Marvel that Monica Rambeau was the superhero that also went by Captain Marvel, but also Photon. And Pulsar and, like, six other names. <laughs> I mainly knew her as Photon because she had, like, light powers. So yeah. I knew she was... This character was a reference to that and that she would eventually get powers. They don't do a fantastic job of explaining it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, they they kind of... It, I mean, it's... We don't see a lot of her using them either. Like, we... We see that she can see light for some reason, and that her eyes glow blue, which is pretty cool. I mean, we know that we're going to see more of this character later on anyway, so I, I'm fine with them keeping a bit of focus off her, in terms of the explanation at least, but it is a little disconcerting. But she manages to track down Wanda, she's like, hey, who wants to kill you? Help me make that not happen. And Wanda's just like, you know what? I don't believe you. I've been attacked by people like you before. Go fuck yourself. Monica's able to hold her own thanks to her new uh, powers. But Agnes turns up and is just like, hey, uh, Wanda, why don't you come with me? Uh, Monica, you can fuck off. And she takes Wanda down to her basement. And it's like, huh, this is a very uh, creepy dungeony sort of basement. And then it's revealed it was Agatha all along. Which... Yes, I love that song. I must have listened to it at least ten times. And she killed Sparky, too. (gasps) Oh, my God. (laughs) Boo, you suck! Yeah, it turns out Agnes was Agatha Harkness, who's a a long-running Marvel character that I am not familiar with at all, but recognize the name. I was like, I know that name, I know that name. Where do I know that from? Well, Quick Google search. Oh, she's a witch connected to the Scarlet Witch. Okay, all right. It's... Except the big difference is that she's a good person in the comics. She's uh, not a villain. Yeah, in this version, she's a witch <laughs> who's been responsible for all the bad shit that's happening so far. 
She holds. No. <laughs> oh God! And here's something interesting that got uh, brought up to me by David Malofsky. Apparently, with all the episode uh, unique intros so far, they've had very similar chords used in them, which are also used in the uh, song Agatha All Along. And oh, wow. apparently there's a video on YouTube that explains that, but when I went to see it, it had been taken down, So, which sucks. But that, that's very interesting. And it's also just... It's so cool just to see this montage set to this Monsters-esque theme song of re- the reason why all this creepy shit has been going on so far, including killing the dog. And that's how you know you can hate her. She killed the dog. Fuck her. <laughs> and the episode ends with a mid credit scene with Monica investigating Agatha's house, discovering the basement only to be caught by, air quote, Pietro. And I, I think Darcy calls him Pietro because it's fake Pietro. I, there, there's a better pun you can make up for that. I'm not going to do it, but there is something better you could do for that. <laughs> and, and then we jump into episode eight, which I adore. Uh, I think it was probably my one of my favorites of the bunch, if not my favorite of the bunch. Um, yeah, it's it's it. Oh, go ahead. It's it's what's great about it is we've had episodes of, on the show before that have filled in the gaps of the show. What we haven't really had so far is, aside from a few conversations here and there, really filling in the gaps of Wanda herself as a character. And this episode takes advantage of that. We start, though, in Salem in the late 1600s, where Agatha Harkness is being put on trial. (gasps) Burnt at the stake for being a witch? No. Be burnt at the stake for being a naughty witch because it's her own coven that, uh, led by her mum, that is putting her on trial for practicing dark magic. And can I just say, I love any storyline that goes the whole, like, bad witches exist, but also good witches. Like, I like that aesthetic, you know? Yeah, I I enjoyed that first scene. It really set the mood. And the fact that she was kind of trying to do good, and then she was saying she was doing the good, but also killing all the witches in her coven. So it's like, what what is she actually up to here? Yeah, it's it's one of those. It's like um, we uh, we're trying to avoid spoilers necessarily. In season three of the show Cobra Kai, we get a lot of backstory about one of the characters and why they are the way they are, and it's very cool to see a little hint of something like that here. Because and Catherine Hahn is such a phenomenal actor; she does such a great performance as Agnes, but also as Agatha. And when she started to say pleading for her life, you wonder, like, is she just someone who made some mistakes or is she, you know, lying through her teeth? And considering the fact that she kills everyone, including her mum, she might well have been lying through her teeth. And then we cut to the present day and Agatha is just like swatting around saying, oh, your powers don't work in here because I've got a bunch of runes on the wall, which means only I can do special powery shit. Yeah, you didn't go to witch class. You missed the basics and the <laughs> that whole thing. And then it should be important to mention that if you anyone has seen Agents of Shield or if, I think Runaways did it too, the Darkhold, the book is actually in Agatha's basement. Oh, you see, I I didn't know that. I have seen a few episodes of Runaways, but I it, I wasn't a big fan. But yeah, it's this big magical grimoire that Agatha's got. And you might think, oh, so she's been in charge all along. She's the one who's controlling everything. Turns out, no. She wants to know how Wanda is controlling Westview because she's very interested in her powers. And it's like, wait, so Agatha isn't in control? Who the Who's responsible for all this? I feel like Daffy Duck. Oh, wait, you guys, who's responsible for this? <laughs> Yeah, and, and she shows that even with preparation, even with runes and incantation, she can't. She just can't do what Wanda did. Not on the same level, She's, at least. Yeah, she she says, "Oh yeah, I can transform things into other things if I prepare." 
and I can do this if I prepare, but what you're doing is insane. You're not putting any incantations. You're just thinking of something and it happens. And there's got to be an explanation for it. So we're going to find an explanation. We're going to take a little trip down memory lane. And she basically forces Wanda to relieve... uh, Relive. I always say relieve. It's not relieve. (laughs) The opposite of relieve. To relive uh, moments from her life that really shaped who she was. Including why she's so into sitcoms. It turns out she, her brother, and her parents used to gather around, put on a bunch of old VHSs in an attempt to learn English in war-torn Sokovia. Right up to the point where her parents were killed by an unexploded Star Industries missile. Which we know about from her backstory, but we never got to see it, which is very cool that we got to see that. And apparently, one thing we didn't know was they were trapped in that room because they didn't know whether or not the bomb would go off for two days. With their parents dead. And then Wanda is trying to look back and remember what happened. She's just looking at her younger self. And then Agnes reveals that she used probability magic on the bomb. Yeah, And everyone, and at least I was shook, because at that point of the story, you think she she got the powers from the Mind Stone. This version of Wanda got powers from Mind Stone. That's mm. what happened. That's what we've been and told. And then Agnes is like, no, no, you had powers. The Mind Stone, as we saw in five minutes later in that episode, she, the Mind Stone just was steroids. There were magical steroids for you. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Hex magic is what Wanda's powers have always been called in the comics. In Age of Ultron and subsequent movies, they didn't call it hex magic. They said she had telekinesis and a form of mind control. I was like, okay, why are you downgrading her? Maybe this was the plan all along. I, I doubt it. But it's cool that they're going back to that and describing it as hex magic. Because that's really cool. The fact she can alter probability. Uh, then we cut to Wanda getting experimented on by Hydra, the whole Mind Stone thing. And then after that, we get to see her interacting with the Vision, watching a sitcom in the Avengers compound, and seeing the beginning of their romance. And it's Which was nice. It was, I think it was a very needed scene, too, because we don't get to see enough of it. You know what? It's... I have a soft spot in my cold black obsidian heart for two characters that are very weird and very different, but sort of find each other and bond over their uniqueness rather than being at odds with each other. And it's, it's really sweet and really cute. And they, and Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen has such great chemistry in all of these stories. They really do. Then it's revealed that Wanda went back to saw to try and cover the vision's body uh was told by Hayward, you can't, but actually left without the Vision's body. Ooh, we won't tell that earlier. She goes to a lot in Westview that Vision, Vision had brought for her, uh, intending for it to be their home. In a fit of grief, she completely creates this whole world, the WandaVision world, out of nothing. And it's <laughs> and that's how this whole thing happened. She then breaks out of the trance in the present goes out of the street where Ag- Agatha has got her kids hostage and reveals that you are the Scarlet Witch roll credits furthermore in a post credit scene they reveal that they've managed to g- sword reveals they managed to get the Vision's body up and running again so now it's like White Vision And there's a sale at Pennies! I think I've broken that clip. Sorry. Anyway, last episode. Agatha Harkness reveals that, okay, here's what I want. I want to absorb your chaos magic. But don't worry, if you do that for me, I'll let you have this reality. I'll let you keep it. Vision pops back up. Fake vision pops up, or possibly real vision pops up. I'll just call them vision and white vision, just for clarification's sake. Uh, they all fight. It's a big, huge brawl. All the sword people start moving in now that the hex has started to break down. 
Wanda is forced to confront the fact that she's controlled all these people. Monica is captured by Pietro, but then removes this like necklace thing that Agatha has been used to controlling him, revealing that because for this whole show, Agnes has been talking about her husband Ralph. It turns out this is Ralph. This is his name is Ralph Boner. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's not Pietro, which is a little disappointing for me because I thought like, oh, multiverse, whole thing. But you know what? It's a cute reference. I don't care. Marvel are going ahead, apparently, with an X-Men story anyway. So everyone's going to get recast anyway. So who gives a shit? She managed to escape. Big, huge brawl. Wanda battles Agatha up in the sky with magic against magic. But it turns out Wanda put the runes on the walls of the Hex. Meaning Agatha is completely powerless. And she says, you know what? I'm going to punish you by forcing you to become the character you pretended to be. And I'm thinking... Which is the worst. Oh my god, it's horrific. (laughs) But kind of appropriate. You know? She does that. And she's like, don't worry. If I need any guidance with the whole magic thing... You'll be here. Oh, and she gets oh, 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 and she gets a brand new costume. A what Scarlet Witch costume? Holy fuck! Yes. Yeah, I, I, I like the the cruelness of it because even Agatha says this is you're just cruel. And she's like, yeah, I am. And here you go. Bye. <laughs> and uh, White Vision runs away. Um, he he has his epiphany while fighting Vision, and he runs away and never to be seen again. <laughs> Well, we don't um, know, because you never know. He might pop up again. Who knows? Uh, yeah, I, but I, he I, is I like... aware that he is Vision, which is good. And he has all the memories, other than he has no Hex memories, but he has all the memories. I thought he didn't have the memories, but we'll explore that later on. I also love how Vision convinces White, Vi- White Vision uh, about the whole thing with the ship of Thesis. Um paradox yeah that's really cool uh so hayward gets arrested for the whole faking evidence and building you know super secret vision weapon thing and uh everything gets wrapped up in a pretty nice uh bow except oh the hex is still up vision is still around her kids are still around and wanda's like this can't last so they go home they tuck their kids into bed and they share one last moment with each other as Wanda collapses the hex and making everything go away. It's truly gut-wrenching. I'm not crying, you're crying. Who's cutting all these onions? It really it really was a sad moment. I think they, they did a good job with, with that. And then and then leading on to all the townspeople hating Wanda, being afraid of Wanda, because for all intents and purposes, she was the villain to them. She trapped them in their mindscape. That, that, that bit where Emma Colford is just like, hey, so maybe my daughter could be like a friend of your kids or school bully. Can you just let her out so I can hug her? I was just like, oh, God, that's such a gut punch. And she realizes that, yeah, she can't ever face up to all the horrible things she's done here. So... After making a little bit of peace with uh, the remaining people, she flies away and goes into hiding. Uh, Monica is uh, contacted by a scroll disguised as an FBI agent saying that... Nick Fury. Yep. And in a post credit scene, we see Wanda, now truly the Scarlet Witch, studying the Darkhold in a remote cabin, suddenly hearing her sons crying out for help. <gasps> And so that's the only thing that leads me to believe that there might be another season of One Division. I don't know. Maybe I imagine we'll get more. we we do know that the multiverse of madness that's been confirmed on Feige and everybody that the multiverse of madness will have been directly affected by the events of One Division. And it is important to note that Agnes did a did a name drop on Doctor Strange. She says the Scarlet Witch's powers dwarf that of the Sorcerer Supreme. So, yeah. So I would love to put that to the test. I would love to see 
uh, Stephen, uh, you know, Doctor Strange show up and be like, hey, what are you doing? You're making a mess of the multiverse. Come on, let's get it together here. And so, yeah, so we're going to talk about our final thoughts in just a moment. Before we do that, one last time, here's a bunch of ads. And we're back. Okay, so, WandaVision. This is what happens when incredibly creative people think outside the box and incorporate different subgenres and different ideas and meta commentary into each other. It, 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 it's awesome. It's. I think this is almost like the twin peaks of our time. Yeah. It. It was an absolutely. It was. It was like. It was nothing like I've ever seen before. It was an absolute triumph of a show because it did something different yet the same every single episode. They changed the style. They changed the camera. They changed the costumes. I. I feel so bad for their poor costume and lighting design. <laughs> no, feel good about them because I bet they had a blast trying to recreate all these things. Apparently, uh, I think they built the sets from the ground up, I think. Um, it's incredible. It's incredible what they did. And they deserve, and they're going to get a lot more work after this because it, it was an amazing piece of television. Honestly, I... I would say that the the last episode where it was just fighting was probably, and not saying that it was bad, but it was probably my least favorite because it stemmed away from the the intricate uh, mystery that we had been unraveling the whole time. And I completely get it was that. Just, it worked. It, it worked really well, and it, it was the resolution that we had to have. I get that, but it was it was still fantastic, and. Oh God, the character, the actors, Elizabeth Olsen, Paul Bettany, Catherine Hahn, Teona Paris, Randall Park, Kat Dennings, Evan Peters, all these people, which gave such fantastic performances. The writing is so great. The sound design, the costume design, everything, uh, aside from like one or two very, very minor nitpicks that really aren't problems to begin with. I have zero complaints. Is this what that feels like to have zero complaints about something? Right. I know. I, I honestly can't believe it. I find myself nitpicking, especially on a lot of things, because I I have helped with uh, sound and rigging, and I've done like the, 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 the production aspect. And so I'm like one of those off, awful movie people that just like, mm, I don't know if I like the scene here. <laughs> but I can't do that here it just i can't i can't do it the lighting is always good the shots are always good there's always good framing and i'm just like i i hate you marvel you can't do this to me i have if i'm not bitter then what am i they they've set standards now that they're going to have to maintain which don't get me wrong are good standards to maintain and i for one can't wait to see what they do next black widow's got some big shoes to fill i guess Oh god. And but I think the next thing we're getting is Falcon Winter Soldier. It comes out in what two weeks, not even? <laughs> yeah, so Marvel is kind of spoiling us this year. And frankly, we deserve it. We, we Yes we do. We absolutely need this. And I've I- been good kids this Christmas. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, can we have some great TV shows this year? Of course we can, darling. You deserve it. <laughs> And on that note, unless you've got anything further to add, I think we're going to end the show. Thank you very much, Francisco, for joining me today. Thank you so much. This has been fun as always. And if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends, shout it from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes, like all the other Marvel stuff we've done. It's a whole bunch of stuff. We love Marvel over here. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or at podcapers.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ap2hyc. Thank you very much, Dan Harris, for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Pod Capers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!